My name is Maria Blanco, and I'm a member of the board of directors at PPIC. And we're very pleased to present this program today called uh, Preparing California for Census 2020. And we're featuring state and local experts discussing what's at stake for California. Uh, I said to somebody today, to my chagrin, that this is, I think, my third or fourth census I've been involved in in California. So um, I'm one of those census nerds. And um, I'm also a member of the California Redistricting Commission. And um, this is such an important topic for California. And I'm glad that by looking at the crowd, you think so as well. We're very fortunate today to have Secretary of State Alex Padilla here uh, for the first part of the program. Thank you, Secretary, for taking part in today's program. Uh, this event is part of PPIC's uh, 2019 speaker series about California's future. We would like to thank the sponsors of this event for their underwriting support and for their support of the whole series. Uh, the organizations that have sponsored the speaker series are on the screen um, over there. And I think they're also on your table. Um, this series is funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, groups of individuals and corporations that provide generous support to PPIC. Please uh, consider joining us as a sponsor or donor so that we can continue to make these programs free uh, in person and online. And um, if you are interested in doing that, you can also uh, get information at your table. We really depend on you to be able to bring these important dialogues uh, to, to the state of California. Uh, before I begin, uh, just a couple of things. The traditional, please silence your cell phone. And also, you'll be, if you signed up online, you'll be getting a little survey after the event. Please answer it. We really do try and improve after each event. And I think you'll see that we have a very good event for today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Maria, for those, uh, for those kind words and also for your leadership on the PPIC board. We appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Secretary Padilla, who is, will be speaking about the 2020 census today. I think all of you know uh, about Secretary Padilla, but let me just mention a couple of highlights. Uh, one in particular that's relevant to our conversation today is that um, there is no one in state government um, who knows more about civic participation than the Secretary of State, uh, being in charge of elections and voter registration. And so uh, it's a wealth of knowledge on this topic. Uh, Secretary Padilla was elected as Secretary of State in 2014. Uh, before he was Secretary of State, he was on the State Senate uh, from 2006 to 2014. And before that, was a member of the LA City Council. So he has uh, served in, in local government and legislature and now in one of the constitutional offices. A pleasure to be with you today. And uh, really looking forward to this uh, conversation. And we had agreed in advance to, um, uh, to, for you to share your perspective about uh, what's at stake for California in the 2020 census, and are we ready for it? Great. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, after the conclusion of today's program, you're all going to be official census ambassadors in the state <laughs> yeah. uh, because we take community leaders and opinion leaders, and we begin to inform, and then we all have a responsibility to go back to our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and spread that information, right? That's how this works. That's how we spread the word on don't forget to register to vote, and how. That's how we spread the word on don't forget to vote, and we had record turnout last year. And it's gonna take that kind of effort to make sure that every Californian is counted in the 2020 census. Uh, so first, a quick civics lesson. Uh, that's going to be, I think, important in a lot of the issues that are covered today. Written into the United States Constitution is a requirement for every 10 years there to be a national population count. Note those words. Not a national 
citizens count, a national population count. Um, and why is it important every 10 years? It's the results of the census that determine some very critical things. If you know anything about the census, you probably know that it's the census data that drives federal funding formulas for the next decade. So as we worry constantly about California getting its fair share of federal dollars for housing, for transportation, for health care, for education, on and on and on, it's important that every Californian be counted. Because if there's an undercount, we stand to lose at the minimum billions, but very likely in the billions of dollars over the next decade for vital services that Californians are entitled to. But you should also know the second thing that the census drives. It drives the reapportionment process, right? How many representatives from each state to represent us in Congress uh, as we try for one person, one vote. You know, it's census data that, that drives the allocation, the apportionment of congressional seats throughout this, the country. So again, if there's a national population undercount or an undercount in each state, we literally lose our fair voice in Congress. And as Secretary of State, I'll add one more. You know, by extension, the census data drives redistricting. So census in 2020, redistricting in 2021. If we have a population undercount, the data used to draw congressional districts, legislative districts, et cetera, are imperfect, compromising our voting rights. So there's really a lot riding on census data, which is why it's so important that we all work together to ensure that every Californian is counted. And are we ready for it? Are we ready? Uh, not yet, but that's why we're all here. <laughs> the good news is we're a little bit more than a, a year away. April 1st is gonna be census day. So uh, expect a lot of buzz and activity April 1st of this year, uh, celebrating sort of that one year out marker. Uh, but trust me, there's a lot of folks, uh, not just in the private sector, in the foundation world, labor unions and others gearing up for the census. But California, I like to think, is uh, a little bit ahead of the curve on this. Having learned from 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago, we have the highest level of investment, not of federal dollars, I wish that was the case, but of state dollars in early census outreach and preparation because we know what the stakes are for uh, the most populous state in the nation, California, and the most diverse state in the nation, California, with 30% of the nationally recognized hard to count communities here in California. Uh, so under uh, uh, Governor Brown's last budget, there was uh, 90, 100 million or so dedicated to early preparation, the creation of a uh, a census outreach office, right? Our complete count committee that's been formed. Under now Governor Newsom, there's an additional 50 plus million dollars for the same commitment. How do we lay out the infrastructure of working together, working with leaders in all regions and all counties of the state and both local outreach plans and some statewide uh, communication strategies to try to reach every Californian in as many languages as we speak as possible. So we do have a lot of hard to reach populations in California and we're very large and we have a lot of languages that are spoken in California and there have been changes to how the census uh, will take place in 2020 compared to previous years. Maybe you could talk a bit about how the 2020 census is going to be different from the, from the earlier census and what implications that has for the count. So I think a, a couple of things. So we'll get the bad news out of the way, right? Okay. And then focus on the good news of how we will overcome the challenges. You know, similar to uh, uh, elections and voting rights, uh, the federal government, you would think, it should be a reliable partner in how we facilitate civic participation. Unfortunately, the current administration has proven to be anything but both in the voting rights arena, in elections arena, as well as the census. So we're going into a 2020 census with a census that for the last several years has been underfunded and therefore understaffed. And while they're trying to play catch up, time has kind of run out to do the level of testing 
of a census survey like is typically done. Right? For decades, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, they've at least followed the advice of their scientific advisors of how to go about crafting the census survey and testing it to make sure you get it right. Uh, and that's important because we don't get a second chance to get the census right. We get one shot. And so we do everything we can to make sure that we're going to get it right. Well, that hasn't been the case for this go around. That's one of the challenges. Number two, we have changes in policy for the Census Bureau, like, you know, to the extent canvassers are going to be part of the mix, you know, uh, working uh, to reach out to households that didn't respond to the census survey, they change the rules on who can work as a canvasser. It used to be the case that, of course, United States citizens are eligible for this federal job opportunity, but knowing a unique role that legal permanent residents can play, culturally competent outreach and uh, uh, canvassing activity in those hard to count communities, this administration changed the eligibility requirements for canvassers. So even legal permanent residents can no longer perform that function, only United States citizens. That's gonna hurt, we're gonna have to overcome that. Uh, another important challenge, this is gonna be uh, an online census for the first time, right? So for those of you, where's Maria, who got, remembers getting the, the census form 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a previous, now what you're gonna get first is a letter with instructions on how to go online to submit your information, right? And we should talk about that a little bit more at length because you know, we're just coming off of yet another election when cybersecurity maybe was a concern for some, or the impact of misinformation or disinformation in the voting space was a concern for a lot of us. Now imagine having to navigate those concerns in the census world as well. Uh, but the last thing I'll mention right now, and this is what's gotten most of the attention recently, is this administration's decision to question the citizenship of every person in America. Right? They, they made the decision to add a question about citizenship as part of the survey, uh, which history tells us has the effect of discouraging people from participating. Questioning everybody's citizenship undermines the very purpose of the census itself, which is why I was proud to stand with Attorney General Becerra the day after that decision was made to announce California's legal challenge of that decision. Other states and jurisdictions have followed. There's been at least two cases now where federal judges have ruled in our favor, uh, but like a lot of other things, it's now winding its way up to the Supreme Court. So they'll have uh, a final say in this come June, and we'll have to prepare either way how to overcome the citizenship question being on the survey, uh, or hopefully we prevail and continue the work that's uh, hard enough to do every 10 years without those sort of uh, uh, obstacles. So if the Supreme Court says that it's okay to ask this question, what will we do to encourage people to participate in the census? Right. We'll still want to, we'll, we will still need to make sure everybody participates in the census. One of the challenges we may have as uh, an organizing committee, right, outreach committee, and I'm including all of us here over the next year, uh, is how to navigate the question, well, do I fill this one out or not, mm -hmm. right? But not participating in the census is not an option for all the reasons I've already covered. Federal funding formulas, there'd be apportionment process, voting rights, et cetera. Uh, a lot of other information, a lot of other questions that will appear uh, on the census, no matter what, that we need to uh, uh, get that California data from. Uh, you know, and part of the challenge, you know, those hard to count communities are hard to count for a reason. Whether it's young people, whether it's lower income uh, communities, whether it's uh, uh, communities of color, especially immigrant communities that may not be as familiar with the census. Faith and trust in government is tough enough in those communities let alone the political environment that we're all living in. So uh, again, so many reasons for why this question doesn't make sense. I'm gonna remain optimistic until at least the uh, Supreme Court takes an action on this one uh, before we uh, figure out the next steps. 
So during your time as Secretary of State, we've seen voter registration increase from about 17.7 .7 million to about 19.9 .9 million. And we also, you were elected in 2014 in what was one of the, the lowest turnout uh, midterm elections in California's history. And we just experienced one of the highest uh, per, uh, numbers of people uh, participating in an election. So I'm hoping that for this uh, working committee that's here today, including me, you have some advice for us about how do you encourage people to participate in something when they lack faith in government, when they don't think what they, they're doing matters, when they're worried about privacy um, issues, and when they might be misinformed about uh, the process. Right, so, uh, uh, so I do think there is some good news here. So we'll start to, to shift the conversation. First, you know, California's kind of been here before, uh, especially when you, you talk about the immigrant community in California. Some of you are still on the younger side, but not all of us, I, and I count myself in the not all of us category. But remember 1994, the year of Proposition 187. Right? That was not that long ago, folks, when in California there uh, was that measure on the ballot in November that technically said, okay, we're going to begin to make ineligible immigrants and children of immigrants from certain public services. The very reason that measure even appeared on the ballot was because of the anti-immigrant environment that was California not that long ago. And I'll remind us all that before the measure was ruled unconstitutional in a court of law, the measure passed by a big margin in California. But what happened ever since? You saw a variety of communities and the next generation of voters also organize. You saw a lot of people, frankly, like my parents, who had lived here as legal permanent residents for nearly 30 years without beginning the naturalization process, finally do so. That was a lot of Californians that went through the process, became citizens, and registered to vote, and have been very frequent, if not regular voters, and a whole generation coming up with a very different political mindset. That's why we have the California that we see today. You know, so the reason I share that is because, yes, despite the challenges on the census in 2020, I think it actually can serve as a motivating factor. Right? People know that certain communities are under attack across the country, uh, people know that the president has it in for the state of California, right? It couldn't be more clear. And so what do we do? Do we just take it lying down, lying down? Or do we organize and participate to overcome it? I think that was a big factor in the tremendous turnout rates last year. Hmm. Yes, we're making it easier to be registered and to cast your ballot. Online voter registration, automatic registration, pre-registration, same-day registration, I see a summit member, uh, Mark Berman here, who's been a great partner in the legislature on a lot of these policies. Despite the threats against California, we registered and voted in record numbers last year. Highest turnout since 1982 in the midterm election. So that's what we have to try to achieve when it comes to the census. Despite the challenges, despite the threats, take that as motivation. You know, and as we share that with all of our friends, all of our family, everybody we come across over the course of the next year, we got to stand up and defend California. And a part of defending ourselves from these attacks is to participate. And who are the partners that have to get involved and engaged over the next year to make for a high turnout in the um, census in 2020? Yeah. So it's going to be, it's all hands on deck time, you know, yet again. Uh, we can't, obviously, we can't just. Uh, expect the federal government to do it all for us. Mm -hmm. That's why the state of California has stepped up with uh, the legislature and the governor's leadership. Governors plural, Governor Brown and Governor Newsom. Uh, you're also seeing increasingly individual counties and cities starting to build into their budgets uh, line items for census outreach, census activity to help raise awareness, help inform uh, and communicate to the general public. But it's not just government on our own. Uh, it's got to be the private sector, the foundation world. There's a lot of conversations going on now about significant investments to leverage the public dollars to make sure that we uh, reach as many Californians as possible and do it in a smart way. 
Uh, it's not just a matter of well, how much money can we cobble together and uh, hand it out to, to counties you know, on a per capita basis. We know some counties have you know, bigger needs than others. Uh, some counties have a lot of infrastructure built out with community organizations uh, for purposes like this where others may not. So we have to be strategic in where and how we communicate, not just in English, not just buying PSAs. You know, consider this, uh, taking a, a page out of the political candidate and campaign playbook. Once upon a time, a, a candidate or a campaign would be satisfied with just sending out a couple of campaign mailers into the mailboxes, and maybe if they can afford it, uh, finance some uh, people to call you during dinner and say, we're asking for your vote. Right now, it's different, whether it's through, through television, through radio, through print, through social media, through grassroots events. There's so many more ways that people consume information and get their news, and our census average has to reflect that, and not just in English, in the hundreds of languages that are spoken across the state of California. In your opinion, the 150 million plus, which the state has allocated for this purpose, is that enough money or are we gonna need more? There's never enough money. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, why I'm proud to say PPIC has made a pledge. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> got the biggest laugh of all. Uh, no, look, we, we, we can all contribute in our own way. Yes, if there's a, uh, uh, pu public sector or private sector folks willing to invest in these strategies and you know, sign up and you'll continue to hear from the California Complete Count Committee on how we can leverage those dollars on a statewide basis, on a regional basis, or on a very local basis. Uh, but it's going to be, like I said, all hands on deck time to make sure that we're reaching anybody and everybody we can in the state of California. And each region has its unique challenges, right? It's not just, oh, well, there's language diversity here. So here's one example of how, where the state is trying to be smarter in how we invest. For the first time in state history, uh, and I haven't heard of other states that do this, but I won't go out on a limb, I don't want to be wrong, but at least for the first time in California history, there, we're, we're investing in sort of language services. Why, as part of our grant making, will we accept the inefficiency of every county committee or grassroots organization having to translate materials for themselves. What if the state of California did a lot of the translating of outreach materials so that's one less expense for everybody? That's what we're doing, right? California is also providing template materials, social media graphics, flyers, et cetera, that local groups can take and run with, right? Put as much of the investment at the local level as possible into the actual outreach Try to minimize, you know, the, the administrative back of office stuff. That's uh, uh, one example of how we're trying to be a smarter about it. So we're about 53 weeks away from April 2020 now. Um, what do you want to see happen in the next six months that will lead to greater success when we have the 2020 census? Okay. Well, for starters, and only because uh, there's at least one legislative leader in the room. <laughs> Uh, we know that Governor Brown, in his last proposed budget, had mm -hmm. a good number for census planning and outreach, and the legislature, to their credit, took that number and made it bigger, right? And so now we have a line item in this year's proposed budget. Let's see what the legislature can do uh, to either increase the investment or help us flesh out those strategies. Look, we're going to be building momentum here. We're going to be building on a lot of uh, what's already in place. Uh, whether it's voter registration, get out the vote, uh, coming to the aid, for example, of families that are separated at the border. We have a lot of experience working together between state government, local government, community groups, foundations, labor unions, individual employers throughout the state when the time calls for it. We do it after wildfires, we do it after earthquakes and floods and other tragedies. We're going to be focused on utilizing a lot of those relationships that already exist, a lot of the infrastructure that already exists to emphasize census, census, census. I'll make two more comments because I know we want to leave some time for, yes. for some questions. One, examples of one state agency's infrastructure that I'm kind of referring to. Uh, you know, in our office we have 
you know, a, tr a pretty aggressive outreach program through high schools throughout the state. Uh, record pre-registration too, not just voter registration. Well, we can build in and we will build in census messaging through our high school outreach, not just pre-registration to vote. Same thing with our college and university partnerships, uh, democracy at work where we work with larger employers and how to communicate to employees and their customers about voter registration and voting. So we're gonna bring the, that to bear, those partnerships to bear when it comes to the census. Last last comment is this. Uh, I wish I could say it was intentional, but it, it, it's gonna work in our favor regardless. So census is next April on the tail end of the canvas period of our very successful and smooth presidential primary election in 2020. <laughs> right? Mark your calendar, March 3rd, presidential primary. That means that for all, you know, 10 years ago, the, the schedules overlapped. In 2020, we'll be able to do all the don't forget to mm -hmm. register, don't forget to vote, get the election mm -hmm. behind us, most of the canvas period behind us, so we have a clean window to just focus on the census through the months of April and their canvas period before we gear back up for the November general election. So we're just going to be busy all 2020. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to the census time, we'll be able to be uh, clearly focused on just that for the appropriate time period. Secretary Padilla, thank you very much for being thank with you, us Mark. today. We're, we're going to take... We're going to take a few questions while we're reconfiguring the stage, so we're just going to, we're just going to step up to the front of the stage, and uh, we're getting the stage ready for the next uh, panel. And anybody have any questions for Secretary Padilla? Over here? Yes? Oh. Uh, thank you, Secretary Padilla. Do you have any strategies for reaching out to the homeless population? Mm. Yes. Uh, Asking for your help, number one. <laughs> number one. And again, it's always, uh, it's not a matter of sort of creating it from scratch. A lot of counties, and especially a lot of the major cities, the bigger cities in California have uh, infrastructure in place. Uh, there's already been some jurisdictions doing sort of an informal census survey uh, of the homeless population in their local jurisdictions. Los Angeles does it, I know. San Francisco does it, I know. Sacramento under Mayor Steinberg's leadership. Uh, is doing uh, elements like that. So it's a matter of formalizing that and replicating that in other jurisdictions. One more question. Yes. In Sacramento County, 13% of the people, <clears throat> sorry, in Sacramento County, 13% of the people aren't on, don't have, don't have an internet connection. Mm. How are we gonna reach, all, I'm on the local committee, <laughs> one of the local committees here, how are we going to reach 13% of the population with no internet connection if right. this is all online? Right. No, and so, uh, again, mixed news response here. Uh, the decision to go to an online census, while the stated intent might be a good one, right? Oh, we can be much more efficient, we can save money, and how to repurpose some taxpayer dollars. But it does not reflect the reality of a digital divide that continues to exist in America, including California, both from an access standpoint and from a literacy standpoint. So again, part of the planning and messaging that we have to put together, but at least there's gonna be multiple bites at the apple. You know, after a couple of attempts by the Census Bureau to reach each and every household, you know, there's still gonna be the form for those who do, don't comply uh, through online sub submitting of their data. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I think we're gonna focus heavily on how to assist folks uh, bringing laptops to the doorstep if we need to, right, to be able to facilitate uh, them participating and submitting their data. Secretary Bedea, thank All you very right. much thank for you your Mark. leadership. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. And we're, we're, now, we're now going to have our second panel. And I'd like to introduce the moderator, who is a friend and colleague, and also an expert in civic participation, also Karthik Ramakrishnan who uh, is the founding director of the Center for Social Innovation at UC Riverside. And Karthik is, uh, comes from the research community and one of the leading experts that, that you'll find a go-to person on this. And he's put together a fantastic panel and I know very, uh, very good set of questions will come from this and a lot of information for you. So here we go.
Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, and co-author with Mark Baldessari. You know, that's that was one of my early early work in California. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here, uh, both in person uh, and live stream on the web. Uh, we have such an such an amazing uh, panel here, uh, and uh, we we'll just get right to it. Uh, you have the biographies of uh, of each of these panelists uh, in your program, so I'm not going to uh, read out. Uh, the very illustrious and extensive bios that you see there. Um, but I'll just uh, briefly introduce each speaker and uh, ask them to offer some initial remarks uh, in terms of uh, discussing uh, California's preparedness for Census 2020 and implementation from their own particular vantage point. So we'll start first with Assemblymember Berman, who's the chair of the Assembly Select Committee on the Census. Uh, from your perspective, um, what, what are some of your thoughts in terms of our level of preparedness for Census 2020? Well, I, I, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. I uh, really appreciate the chance to come back and, and chat with folks about the Census. I had the opportunity to be here last year as well, uh, and I'm just really gratified by the uh, kind of consistent focus that people are making on the Census because it's going to take a long time uh, to get everybody aware of and participating in the Census. And I think uh, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Uh, the Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon, reached out to me about a year and a half now uh, to, to you know, suggest to me that we needed to get organized on the census. I remember it was the fall of my freshman year in the Assembly. Uh, I was actually at the gym uh, trying to work off the freshman 15 that I put on <laughs> in my first year in the Assembly. Uh, and the Speaker texted me to say, hey, we really need to focus on the census. Uh, earlier than we ever have before. Uh, and the bad news is that I'm not in any better shape now than I was then. Uh, so I'm clearly wasting money on the gym. Uh, the good news is we are better prepared than we ever have been before. And I think you heard a lot of that from the Secretary of State. Uh, and there are th three big areas of focus for us. One is adequate funding. Uh, and we, the state has already appropriated $100.3 million for census outreach and communication, and the governor proposed another $54 million in this year's budget. And, and I heard uh, the Secretary of State's challenge to the legislature that maybe we should try to bump that up. So uh, Budget Chair Phil Ting will be my first call after, <laughs> after the panel. Um, and then the second area is coordination, uh, and really making sure that there's great coordination from the state level, from Dita Skatagi uh, and her colleagues, all the way on down through our counties, through our cities, to our neighborhood CBOs, and even lower than that. We had a select committee hearing on the census last week, uh, and I learned about Pookie. Uh, and I don't know who Pookie is, uh, but Pookie knows, and I don't know if Pookie's a male or a female, uh, but Pookie knows their whole neighborhood. And Pookie might not have her own nonprofit or his own nonprofit, um, but Pookie knows his or her community and knows where people live and, and kind of what concerns they have, and knows how to reach them and with what message. So how do we get from Didas all the way down to Puki uh, to make sure that we're, we're coordinating from neighborhood level all the way up to the state level? And then the last is coordination, uh, or collaboration, uh, and making sure that we're all working together from government, uh, state, county, city, uh, the philanthropic sector, the nonprofits, uh, and making sure that you know, we're speaking with a consistent message to the similar communities and also that we're not duplicating efforts because we don't have enough time or, or resources to, to be duplicating efforts over the next uh, year. Excellent. Thank you, Assembly Member. And we'll drill deeper into some of those coordination questions uh, as we go into uh, Q&A. Uh, next, we go to uh, Ditas Katagi. Um, uh, you were mentioned by the Assembly Member, uh, the fearless leader of California Complete Count uh, for the uh, state of uh, California. Uh, can you tell us what has the state done so far on census preparedness? I know we only have about four minutes, so okay. within those four minutes, <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> uh, but particularly with respect to counties, ACBOs, media organizations, you're working with so many different types of entities. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I was here last year with the assembly member, and I was a staff of one. And so <laughs> the good news is uh, we now have 33 people working on this, thanks to. Uh, government operations and the budget and uh, the governor's office for doing that. So I have a huge list. I talk really fast. I feel like I should say in a partridge and a pear tree at the end of it. <laughs> uh, but we've gone to 33 staff. 28 have been hired within since August. That includes our regional program managers and our sector outreach staff. Some of my staff is sitting right over there. 
I'm very glad to have them. We've identified and opened uh, or opened five field offices for Sacramento, LA, San Diego, uh, Fresno, and Oakland. We're just waiting for our Fresno RPM, our regional program manager, to start and um, be approved. We held 24 convenings last summer, and you're very instrumental in the one in Riverside and Palm Desert, so thank you. We intend to partner actively with you. We had three tribal consultations and three tribal chairman association meetings that we attended. We stood up our website, census.ca.gov. Everybody should be going to that. Uh, and our social media, California, hashtag California Complete Count. And we created, and last time I talked about this sort of mapping thing that I wanted to do. It's like a year ago. Mm -hmm. Interactive mapping using GIS technology. And we've stood up um, that. It's in the process of being upgraded. We have our California Hard to Count Interactive Map. That is the foundation uh, for SWORD, our statewide outreach and rapid deployment portal. All of you should take a look at it. It's on our website. You can also print out maps. But that's really going to be the basis for our outreach. It'll be the basis for our communication because if you don't know who you're reaching out to, then how can you be effective? And it really starts with good data and really understanding um, how to reach folks. We uh, also appointed a statewide uh, California Complete Count Committee. I call them the fancy people. You know, they're the folks at the governors um, at the statewide level. And each state is trying to have one, but we're so much far ahead. We held five of those meetings, and we also did two reports to the governor from the CCCC. We drafted and submitted numerous reports, which Mark is probably has them all sitting on his shelf, mm -hmm. to the legislature <laughs> and the governor's office. We released two RFIs, uh, re um, requests for information, one for outreach and one for media. Then we also uh, put out five RFPs and funding agreements, uh, counties, tribal, ACBOs, statewide, media RFPs. I'm using a lot of acronyms, so I apologize. I'm going to get through this list. This is my, I'm, I'm going to do this with one breath. So <laughs> let me take a big inhale. We processed and executed 130 contracts. That's what we're in the middle of doing. 45 county contracts, 22 tribal agreements, 10 administrative CBO contracts, 13 statewide CBOs, and 40 county office of education. I think I can like breathe. <laughs> we're planning over 27 implementation working uh, workshops. We call them IPWs. They're kind of like phase two of what we did last year where the convenings were about statewide readiness. Are we ready? And these are where we really get down to business from June to September, working with those contracted uh, folks, as well as other folks like Melina and others who are doing uh, outreach and that are investing in funding to make sure that we don't have duplication and to fill in any of those gaps that we might have. Uh, we're holding, um, and we'll be coming to a community near you, so you guys should all come and attend, holding three county uh, onboarding kickoffs for the counties and planning to do regional and statewide CBO onboarding Launches uh, April 2nd, we're doing a launch on the Capitol steps. And just so you guys know, we're recording and making sure we're documenting all of this so that we don't have to start from ground zero in uh, 2027. So Great. there, I tried to do that really fast. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dita. That was a lot. I and mean, they say the census is the largest peacetime mobilization. Maybe it's mm -hmm. the second largest <laughs> peacetime mobilization that you're doing, just getting prepared for census 2020. Uh, let's go next to Melina Sanchez from James Irvine Foundation. Melina is a leader, uh, particularly in statewide philanthropy, making sure um, that, that, that philanthropy uh, is, is uh, contributing to census, not just in terms of financial resources, but also in terms of expertise. So can you say, Melina, how is statewide philanthropy approaching census preparedness, and how is it investing? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much um, for having me here today. Um, I get the privilege of co-chairing the statewide funders table around census with Tara Westman from the California Endowment, and we are supported by grant makers concerned with immigrants and refugees. Uh, we actually pulled our table together over a year ago, really with the intent of having philanthropy align, organize, and really galvanize for um, additional resources for census preparedness. Um, we came together around two overarching goals. So one is really with the focus on the hardest to count population, and the second is seeing the census as an opportunity for building um, stronger movement building. We see the census as a moment for collective empowerment for those groups in California that have been historically underrepresented. And so while we have a very diverse um, group of funders coming together, we all have this shared work plan around those two goals. Um, as of last year, I think we had more than 20 funders investing a total of about $12 million in census preparedness. I think some things that have gone really well is, um, one, we started much earlier this go around. I think 
we were able to build off of the great work of philanthropy um, 10 years ago. And so they had all sorts of evaluation and research, and we took a look at their lessons learned. And uh, we also benefited from um, being nudged by our national census funders, who a couple years ago said, you know, have you started thinking about census? What's philanthropy going to be doing in California? So what that meant is we've done some early stage investments, which we haven't done in the past. We've invested in policy and advocacy, supporting the work of the Census Policy Advocacy Network, um, really with the hopes that they would identify what are the policy barriers in this current environment and uh, making sure that it was a priority for um, our local decision makers and decision makers throughout the state. Um, the other thing we've been able to um, support on the earlier side was um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what's called LUCA, but there was basically an update to the um, master address file. And so several funders supported community-based address canvassing to say where are these um, you know, untraditional housing units that might get missed, they're low visibility. Um, we know thousands of individuals could be overlooked if they're not in the address files. So um, philanthropy stepped in early to contribute to those efforts. Um, we've had some great success with our regional partners, so community foundations um, helping to set up pooled funds, seed initial kind of listening sessions within communities, um, and we think that's been a real win-win in the partnership with the state because we know um, several of those funders um, then decided to go ahead and apply for the state ABCO contracting and um, think that's a great example of where philanthropy and the state um, are leveraging one another. Um, we're also um, already funding some early stage census outreach um, and field planning. A lot of the um, kind of traditional civil rights groups, multiracial coalitions. We have a cohort of funders uh, really focused on early education, knowing that the zero to five um, population is the hardest age group to count. So they've already been investing in what can happen around um, young children for this census. So there's been quite a lot of activity. I think um, one thing I will say is philanthropy is not monolithic. Everyone's approaching census kind of coming at it from a different priority area. And so I think where we've been successful is having the overarching um, goals, but then also it, you know, it is a little unwieldy trying to figure out, you know, how we manage, you know, more than 20 funders investments. Um, and I think, you know, just wanting to continue to partner with the state, we're lucky to have them participate in our quarterly funder meetings, which has been so valuable for the funders at the table to understand and hear where there are gaps. And I know GSER has monthly calls with the state, so we're really trying to um, find all those intersections. Um, where we haven't quite ramped up yet, and I think we'll talk a little bit about this later, is evaluation. We have some early design thoughts about, um, you know, the evaluations in 2010 were so helpful as leave behinds for lessons learned. Um, so what do we want evaluation to look like um, this go around? Um, so I would say there's, you know, a lot more we can do and we can do better, but I also feel like there's been a really great um, uh, acknowledgement from philanthropy that we need to step in. Great. Thank you, Melina. Mm -hmm. and a couple of the themes you talked about in terms of capacity building and empowerment. Um, as I'll disclose, I'm a board member of the California Endowment, a proud uh, member of the California <laughs> Endowment. And, uh, and I think it's not just uh, funders like ours. I think more and more people are seeing that census is so important. Of course, the count matters. But there's so many other things that are happening that are making our community stronger mm -hmm. as we gear up, as we get prepared. Finally, we have Sarah Bond uh, from uh, PPIC, who's a research fellow as well as director of research uh, at the Public Policy Institute of uh, California. Uh, so Sarah, how is research helping us inform uh, outreach to hard to count populations as well as hard to reach regions? So here I'm going to give a plug to Inland California in capital letters. It's a new formation you may not have heard about yet, but you'll hear more about it in the, in the years to come. But especially in inland California and also in rural areas. Can you, can you flesh that out a bit? Thanks for that question, Karthik, and thank you all for being here. I, I see research as informing and undergirding these efforts that we're talking about in kind of three major ways um, in just identifying hard to count communities and their characteristics in starting to fill in some of the holes and unknowns about the new challenges in the 2020 census, and third, in giving a gauging kind of the current 
level of awareness of the census and likelihood of participation. So to the first, as Didos, Didos was saying, um, you know, the data really undergirds understanding how to reach hard to count communities. And I think it's a bit ironic that the data comes from the census itself. <laughs> um, that's the data that we rely on to understand the hard to count communities. And it reminds us how important these data are year to year and understanding our communities. So that's how we know that at least a quarter, if not a third, of census tracts in LA County, in San Bernardino County, in the Central Valley, um, will be likely hard to count and require follow-up. Um, but knowing more than just that is understanding some, some aspects of why. So looking at communities of color and their range and diversity. Um, and understanding uh, housing characteristics, I would point to, is just practically speaking, how do we reach these communities? In Los Angeles, a lot of hard to count housing is due to um, renters who are overcrowded. But if you go to inland and in rural California, overcrowding is much less of an issue, but you see mobile homes and other forms of non-standard housing. A recent survey of immigrants in the Central Valley found that as many as a quarter didn't have a mailbox at their, um, their, their dwelling place, which makes them inherently harder to count both by the census and by California through some of our means for outreach. Uh, so I highlighted you know, inland California and Los Angeles is hard to count. They have a lot of hard to count communities, but in fact, pretty much every region of the state has communities within them that are hard to count. And these data and research make that really clear so that we can ensure that we're reaching everyone to participate in the census. In terms of research and data informing the new challenges um, in 2020, I would just uh, like to discuss some research around the citizenship question and the response to that. So, um, you know, we're kind of in uncharted territory where there's not, it's, it's a little bit hard to know how people are going to react to the current climate and this, this potentially new question on the survey. Um, but uh, research has shown recently, um, using survey data, that there's likely to be drop off even nationwide on the order of seven to 10% if the citizenship question is included. That drop off is estimated to be higher among immigrants, higher in California, not surprisingly. And in fact, one estimate suggests that the drop off in San Jose alone would be 20%. Which I think is an important finding and interesting for us because we know that there are a lot of immigrants in the Silicon Valley. And we often think of them as different from immigrants in other parts of California, like the Central Valley or Los Angeles. But looking at their potential response to the, the current kind of census uh, environment um, suggests that all immigrants might react um, you know, and, and be less likely to participate. And that's consistent with with another uh, research study done in the Central Valley looking at immigrant communities and even among legal immigrants and US born children of immigrants, there was a, a lo lower willingness to participate. Um, so we're talking about, we need to talk about ways to reach all of these immigrant groups, not just undocumented immigrants. And so I think that research shed some light um, on what we'll need to do and the scale of the, the issue around the, the um, citizenship question in particular. Um, but in addition, uh, recent research has shed light on kind of overall awareness of the census and willingness to participate. And the estimates are not super promising. There's a lower likelihood of participating than in 2010. Um, and that's driven by a historically high distrust in government, as we've alluded to, um, concerns about privacy, confidentiality, um, and concerns that the data, their data will be misused. Overall, there's a pretty low um, awareness of the census. A full 10% of residents think that the census is actually used to identify undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. And another third is not sure. They think it might be used for that. Um, and so that obviously is um, you know, a, a myth or misunderstanding that maybe could be dispelled with appropriate kind of outreach to targeted populations. Um, and in terms of uh, re what research says about motivating participation, um, community benefits is by far and away the largest kind of motivating factor. So understanding funding that goes to your community or information that your local community can use to plan for the future are things that's really um, in the data across lots of groups um, seem to encourage participation. So I think this gives us you know, some um, route forward and some um, basis for understanding the scale that, of the challenge that we're facing and, and some um, opportunities and directions to try to improve our census count. It clearly doesn't, research is not telling us exactly how those messages should be crafted, 
Um, but I think at this point is that basis that we really need to, to start from. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And this actually tees up uh, perfectly the next question I had. Um, so I, the, I think the last um, study you mentioned was actually by the US Census Bureau. Uh, and we, so I direct API data, and we pay a lot of attention to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And we were surprised to see uh, the finding there. Uh, so that survey showed that communities of color were those least likely to say that they intended to participate in the census, and also those most likely to express the concern that census answers could be used against them. But the group that had the highest level of concern was not Latinos, as, what, as we might think, but actually Asian Americans. So that Silicon Valley San Jose finding that you said makes sense to me, um, given this larger finding that we're seeing. Um, but you also see a significant level of concerns among African American populations and Latinos as well. So this is to anyone uh, on, on, the, on the panel. How can we address these concerns and encourage all Californians to participate in the census? Well, I, I think what we need to do is, is constantly reinforce to folks and assure people that the data that's collected by the Census Bureau legally cannot be used for anything other than census purposes. And that there's case law on that, that there have been instances in the past where different federal government departments have tried to use, have requested census data from the Census Bureau and the courts have upheld the law that says that no, nobody can get access to Census Bureau data for any purpose other than for the census. So I mean, nobody can get access to that data. The challenge is that there isn't a lot of trust uh, in the federal government. I remember one of the hearings that Didas uh, and her team helped organize in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, uh, which is in my district, and I went and was chatting with folks there and thanking them for participating. And uh, I was speaking with one of our community leaders from the Muslim community, uh, and, and I said, thank you so much for being here. And she said, absolutely. We've uh, been to a couple of meetings on the census. We're going to keep on going to, to meetings about the census. But I'm not there. I'm not comfortable yet with telling my community that it's safe to participate in this. And I threw out all these answers I had. Oh, but the law and this and that. And she said, I know, I know, I know. And I said, well, what do you need to hear? And she said, I don't know, uh, but I'll know when I hear it. And that is the challenge we have. And I think that's what a lot of the, the media and outreach and message testing that we need to do over the next couple of months um, to, to start honing in on what are those messages that resonate with all the different communities in California, the, the dozens and hundreds of different you know, ethnic communities that we have in California? Because something different is going to work with each one. Uh, and we need to figure out what it is for each community uh, and then make sure that we really uh, you know, uh, uh, inf enforce and reinforce that message to those communities. Great. Malina? Just to build off of that, I think one thing um, Naleo um, has done a great job of is exploring a message. Well, maybe some people don't want you to be counted. So how do you flip that mm -hmm. and say, you know what, I want my community be, mm -hmm. to be counted. We're not going to be scared off from having our numbers like reflect the reality. And so I think a lot of that interesting messaging testing of how do we kind of flip it on its head. Yeah. So quickly, just to do this, are you hearing from communities in terms of when you go out there? Um, so in our convenings, I mean, we convened this last year, the trusted messengers, more grass tops. So we didn't want to go all the way down because then you kind of exhaust the message. So we wanted to hear from those people that would be giving those messages. And like the assembly member said, people are like, look, I don't want to put my reputation out on the line if it's not going to be safe. Um, and I work with um, Tom Sines of Maldef, and they're considering, hey, can we do some type of legislation here at the California level that says absolutely, positively, Title 13 is going to be, you know, and guarantee that at the California, you know, law level. But he was saying that people in Arizona and Texas are like, hey, don't do that. You're going to make us look bad, right, because they're not <laughs> doing the same thing. So there are a lot of people here in California that are trying to figure out how can we put those measures in place to really bring that confidence up of those communities, and how do we get those trusted messengers to believe in it so that they can you know, put their heart out there on the line to say it is confidential and that it is for your community. Great, thank you. So, Member Berman, I think you may have to go. I, I do. I'll risk the wrath of, of <laughs> leadership and be five. I'll, I'll take off in about five minutes. OK, all right. <laughs> we'll see starts, what happens when you get on the floor. Session starts now, but. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well. Um, this next question, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, but then others can weigh in as well, including Ditas and, and others. 
Um, to what extent is there coordination between government and philanthropy when it comes to investments in outreach and preparedness? And is most of that coordination happening locally, or are there statewide conversations happening mm -hmm. on this? Yeah, so I've been going around and, and talking to as many different foundations or phil philanthropic organizations as I can, just preaching the importance of the census and preaching the importance. You know, it was really the philanthropic community that got us, almost guilted us, into increasing the funding last year. Uh, the governor's original budget proposal had $40 million for the census. Uh, and then we had a couple of, of meetings, including one with uh, a, a big group of foundations and the speaker where I can't remember what tack they, they just guilted us. I don't remember what they said, but we walked away saying we have to spend more money. Um, and that was how it, it helped increase it to 90 million. So uh, I've been a part of a lot of the, the talking at the high levels. I'll let Ditas, um, you know, drill down on some of the specifics. Uh, but I think there has been good coordination in making sure that the philanthropic sector knows what the state's going to be doing and therefore, what are some of the holes that, that they can really help fill in? Yeah, so coordination is key, and we've been coordinating over sort of the statewide level, but also on the local regions, and that's why we divided our state up into 10 regions to really get really our hands dirty in terms of who's there and who needs to be at the table, because it's a, a big job for this enormous state. Um, I will say that at the last PPIC um, luncheon, you guys were probably were to hear when Anna O'Leary came, she actually said, she probably, at the very last question, she said, it's probably a $200 million effort. And the state's putting up 154, and that she fully expects philanthropy to step up to, to close that gap. And for the record, the philanthropic sector told me that they would match us one for one. <laughs> now, I think that was before they no realized. No pressure there, Melina. <laughs> that was before they realized we'd step up to 154 million. But it's just reminding folks. With that, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank really you. really appreciate it. Thank you, Assemblyman Berman. Thank you. Thank you. So, Melina, on, uh, I mean, you've talked a little bit about some of the gaps, and especially the hardest to count populations, mm -hmm. and also about empowerment, capacity building. Can you say a bit more about how you're seeing, well, not how you, but how, from your perspective, mm -hmm. statewide philanthropy is seeing its role vis-a-vis -vis government in terms of financing? Yeah, I think um, we are trying to figure out what are the different ways to integrate. So I know, like, the state has a communications uh, task force and so the funder members who've said we want to help support communication efforts are integrated into that task force so we're trying to figure out where their specific pieces of alignment I think um, one thing we've been trying to figure out now to steal your thunder yeah, but Adidas <laughs> and I have been chatting about now that the state has actually awarded its ABCO contracts and statewide contracts do we actually do some sort of a convening so we can kind of get a little further into the um, kind of nuts and bolts of coordination. So Excellent. yeah, probably end of May, uh, early June, my staff's like, uh-oh, writing that down. <laughs> See what happens when you set us next to each other? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I'll say, just to give a plug for our region and the Inland Empire, is that we have the Community Foundation, which not only won the state contract uh, for the ACBO funding, but is also the fiscal sponsor for the private philanthropy yeah. table. And so it's really amazing to see that. It's rare, I think, to have that amount of coordination within one kind of a, an organization that is involved in both. Yeah. But that is one possible way yeah. um, if, if you don't have a more elaborate table to bring it together. And it is great at the local level. I know the California Community Foundation in LA is also um, right. trying to leverage that dual role as well. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, so next, and, and Melina, you, you had uh, previewed this a bit. And I'll open it up, and especially to Sarah as well. Do we have a learning agenda from all of this work? And by that I mean, so the state is collecting a lot of data through its contract work. I'll just say in, in the interest of disclosure, our center was a, uh, was a sub-award sub on, that, on that ACBO contract. Um, so we know that there's a lot of data that's going to be collected at the state level. Philanthropy is also planning on doing some evaluation work very mm -hmm. early stages. Mm -hmm. What kind of data should we be thinking about collecting? And Sarah, maybe I'll start with you on this. What kind of data should we be collecting? What kind of questions should we be looking to answer so that we can synchronize across research, philanthropy, and the state? It's a great question. I'm glad you raised it. Um, when I think of evaluation in the classic sense, like a randomized controlled trial, it's clearly not appropriate here because you don't want to give some Californians a placebo. You want everyone to, to be reached and participate. 
But there are other ways that we can evaluate either within the state or compare to other states that have similar populations, have different levels of investment and outreach strategies. So you know, the data that you would need to be able to do that is a lot that I understand this data is collecting in terms of the investments and the types of outreach. I think you know, we would want to understand the role of philanthropy as a sizable piece of this puzzle um, to kind of get that um, full picture of what has taken place so that we can understand what works. And that could have um, payoffs in other areas, as the Secretary of State mentioned. Um, you know, I even understand that civic engagement and participation at the local level can have long-standing impacts on kind of community well-being, even economic mobility. So these investments and understanding what works um, would be a really critical um, thing to glean from our, our work. So what you're suggesting then is the, the questions, right, in terms of what, what is the outcome that we want to look at? Part of it could be what is the size of the undercount, but it could be a whole bunch of other benefits that could flow out of all the census exactly. outreach. Is that right? Exactly. Great. Um, others on this, what kind of data do you think we should, well, Dita, what kind of data are you collecting? <laughs> so we're starting to design that and we're partnering with um, you know, community groups and foundations because they're actually, they've done this and they do this a lot with every grant that they put out. Um, so we want to make sure we're collecting. So the, the issue with the census is we're, none of us are really operating the actual enumeration, right? Mm -hmm. We're not doing it. The, the U.S. Census Bureau is doing that. So it's, again, how much control do we have? We can look at response rates and then match it up to what we're collecting. So we've talked about in 2000 when we had $24 million, we actually collected impressions, right? How many impressions? They're very marketing. Anybody's in marketing, you collect, you know, how many impressions did you make uh, by different audience and audience segmentations? And I will say in 2000, we did it by like literally hash marks, right? <laughs> Going across. Thankfully, we're not gonna do that this time and we're trying to figure out what is the best way for our community groups on the ground to collect that data and enroll it up in this sort of you know, big data uh, approach. Uh, but we are partnering with that. We wanna know, I mean, I wanna do interim polling or message testing about what resonates out there and, and wanna work with our partners to say, you know, what's working and even as the count is going on full time, because it'll be around March 12th, people will start to get their letters, right? And then April 1st is that point in time, but for me, I would like California by March 23rd of 2020 I'd love 55% of California to have already self-responded. That's my goal. Um, but we want to be able to test along the way, wow, why aren't these areas, you know, whether it's like Koreatown or a census tract there, why aren't they responding to be able to redeploy our outreach resources right away to get that response rate up? That's great. So not only should we see if we're beating Texas, which is not <laughs> investing as much in census, mm -hmm. but even within California, getting that early data Right, and kind of, and have that rapid response. Right. And I have no doubt the IE is going to do great with your, your group. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lillian, yeah, anything only, to add yeah, to this? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is, so in 2010, there was an excellent study by Manuel Pastor and his shop at USC called Beyond the Count, and that really looked at what were these like longer lasting movement building capacities that were built. So we are definitely interested in continue to have that type of a lens to the evaluation as well. Well, let's tease it up to the, and I, I'm not making this up. This is literally the next question. Um, and I will give some props to the Inland Empire here. So in places such as the IE, um, we are looking, and so it's not just our center. It's, it's remarkable how, how widespread the sentiment is. We are, as a region, we're looking at census investments as a historic opportunity to build cross-sector collaboration and collective research and policy capacity. Um, are you seeing this in other regions as well? This is opening it up to anyone. And how can we make sure that we leave communities stronger after the 2020 census than before? So, of course, we mentioned California Community Foundation in Los Angeles County. Even before we had even let the RFP for the ACBOs, they were already they already established a table uh, working with both the city and the county. Um, I would say Region Four and Six, which is basically you know south of here through the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, um, on the fourth of next week. Uh, the ACBO, I mean, we just announced them, they're already jumped on it, and they're going to have a convening of all of our um, um, district offices that are out there. And that includes con congressional districts, the assembly and the Senate, and bringing local folks together. So they're already collaborating and making sure that everybody's working together. We have uh, Judy from Sac County and the Sacramento Community Foundation here in this area are also collaborating. Um, we have so many regions, and they're all kind of in, in a different space of of collaboration, but 
really our dollars that we're investing in the state, I call it forced collaboration. I'm like, you will collaborate. Mm. Uh, when I met with, uh, boy, a year and a half ago, LA City called me, Maria, and then uh, Dorothea called me, and they said, can we meet when you're down here? And I said, only if you get in the room together. Mm. There's like no reason I should be having separate meetings. So uh, we really are trying to push everybody together. If we're getting separate calls. We're trying to marry people up on our website. If there are people who want to be a subcontractor to one of our ACBOs, you can go on our website and say, request to collaborate. Put in your data, and then we will. It's almost you know like Match.com, right? We'll we'll push it out <laughs> to uh, people that are in your area that you can you can collaborate with. And so, are you getting a sense, Ditas, that uh, that there's going to be significant legacy effects? I mean, some hopefully these aren't kind of forced relationships, right? right? That people are not just doing it for the money. That there's some basis of trust and and cooperation already there. But do you get a sense that these these coalitions or these collaborations? will be more enduring uh, even after the funding goes away? I sure hope so. I mean, yeah. the, the, you end up being like family, and you can never kind of <laughs> tell, yeah. is it going to be a functional family or a dysfunctional family? <laughs> but our goal is, I mean, like I said, our overall goal um, is to use the census investment, the dollars that we have, to really build a strong social movement infrastructure throughout the state. And I think all sectors, we've agreed that that's a, an outcome that we really want, uh, whether it's used for like what Secretary of State have said in terms of voting, in terms of EITC outreach, in terms of all the things, the great things that California needs to do, because I'll tell you, another state is doing this. So we're ahead, and people are looking at us to say, what is California doing? And I just came back from training media at the national level, and I gave them the key message, which was, California is not leaving their future. We're not leaving our fate in the hands of this federal administration. And that's why we're all here going to work together. And I think that's something that all us organizers and investors can really understand at a really kind of gut level. Lena, any thoughts on this? I'm yeah, I, I think the other thing is seeing census as kind of like part of a spectrum. So what comes next is like redistricting. And so it's, I think, along the whole civic, engage, civic engagement spectrum of the issues local communities can face, that that infrastructure continues to live beyond census. I'm glad you mentioned that. Maria Blanco was buttonholing me today saying that the Citizens Redistricting Commission is now coming back online and, and we need good people to apply. Um, and so I will, I will echo that message uh, and it's so important. I mean, this is where California's innovation is just so remarkable, right, in terms of even the legacy that we've seen um, and really is a beacon to the rest of the nation. Not, and then this, this goes beyond parties, not having the incumbents drawing the lines, but rather mm -hmm. having the people mm -hmm. have a significant say mm -hmm. in how those lines should be drawn. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, I was just asking about capacity building. As a researcher, <laughs> what are the kind of things, you, I mean, we say there are all these benefits that flow, but I'm sure as a researcher you're thinking, okay, how do I measure all of these <laughs> things? We're always thinking about measurement and data. Right. I would say one thing that if there are um, these benefits that flow from this investment and collaboration, we should pay attention to whether that is kind of the same and in developing equally across the state where you know parts of California already have some of that infrastructure, some of those relationships, and others have it to a much lesser extent. So um, if there really are these um, benefits that flow from it um, and not all regions have that level of cooperation that can foment more civic engagement, then you know we, we would be concerned of kind of increasing inequality and and access to um, that kind of information engagement that would be a concern. Excellent. One thing I'll say is kudos to the state. When you look at their funding formulas, really it's going where the need is, but you also see that it's not your typical kind of funding disparities between the coast and inland or other kind of regional disparities. Um, so hopefully some of that will repair some of those regional disparities uh, that we've seen before. Final question, um, before we uh, open it up to you uh, in the audience who've been so patient. Um, ultimately, in your opinion, what does success look like? Um, of course, having a zero undercount uh, would be one measure of complete success, but are there other measures of success that you think are important uh, that we should, be, uh, we should be thinking about? Do you want me to start? Or Someone's you start? Uh, yeah, alarm or timer is, is going off. So there's, for me, there's a negative <laughs> and the positive way to look at success. And there's, of course, no undercount. And I know that ringtone. That's my, that's my timer ringtone right there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's mine, too. So no undercount, no loss of a congressional seat. I say no disinformation snafus. I'm like just, you know. Uh, but on the positive side, we have 
you know, other civic engagement, um, and ultimately we do want to use these investments uh, to make it go well. So I hate to use like, what is success? N you know, none of this, none of this, none of this, but it's, you know, on the positive side, it's that people come out of looking, staring at their phone, and they start to connect. Hmm. We're having some mic issues yes, here, but there we go. But one one number I'll remember, and I don't know if this will come back to haunt you or us, Dita, is that fifty five percent number. I'm yes. thinking about that. That's what I like saying that this March twenty third will be my fifty fifth birthday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just you know, get everybody do it for Dita. Do it for people. my birthday. Do it right? for Dita. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Melina. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's come up is just that the environment we're in is so much more challenging than 10 years ago. And so I think if there's a way that we can really somehow, again, kind of flip the narrative and flip the fear to more about folks feeling the empowerment of standing up despite all the barriers, I think that um, in this climate would be a big success. Um, and I think, you know, the, the theme has come up about the leave behind infrastructure for communities to partner together on the issues that impact them, I think that would be a huge success. So one thing that we might leave behind also is an awareness of kind of how the census is used for government purposes like funding programs, targeting kind of disadvantaged communities. And if we're able to raise that awareness and educate um, people of, so that they can see these investments in their communities, Maybe it's a little optimistic, but um, in terms of um, improving the trust in government that we have and understanding of how these programs work or are intended to work um, could be another um, huge benefit coming from this effort. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so now we open it up to questions. Uh, so we have mics uh, that are going to be uh, floating around. Um, so if anyone has a question, uh, we have a question. Please uh, say your name and if you have an organizational affiliation. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Maria Alegria. I'm representing the Democratic Party of Contra Costa County. Hello, Maria. Uh, my question, and you didn't cover it, has to do with how do you count folks who are incarcerated? And how do you deal with the cyber attacks on the, if it's gonna be online? Two so questions. I don't work for the US Census Bureau who handles the operations, but what I do know uh, in my education about operations is uh, incarcerated um, folks will be counted in what's called a group quarters. Uh, and in fact, I ran into Ralph Diaz on the plane, <laughs> who's the head of CDCR. Uh, and they were, although the, the incarcerated are counted in group quarters, he and I were talking about how do we, he said there are 700,000 visitors a year to um, those facilities, and I said, well, how can we partner to make sure that they know that they're, count they're counted as well? Um, so that's how the U.S. Census Bureau is going to do that through the group porters uh, process. And then in terms of cybersecurity, um, what I heard at a panel I was on um, earlier this week is that uh, the U.S. Census Bureau has actually been working with folks from Silicon Valley and private sector to make sure that they're, they're building as fast as they can to combat all of the threats that you know, come every day to protect our data. Hi, um, okay. my name's Paul Van Dyke. I'm just wondering, how do we know uh, about undercounts and what types of transparency does the Census Bureau have to audit and um, to double check their work. I think that's fair. Sure. sure, I can speak to, um, you know, there's a couple ways that we estimate undercount or the Census Bureau estimates undercount after the fact. Um, one is through a post enumeration survey where they actually compare individual respondents and see if they're captured in the full census. Um, and that's like, um, becoming a really important way to understand undercounts across demographic groups. But we also look to kind of demographic analysis that the state also maintains uh, understanding births, deaths, and migration patterns as another estimate to compare to. So those that will give us kind of a range of what we think the population should look like in 2020. So when the first data starts coming out, I believe around December 2020 and soon into 2021, we'll know are we outside of that expected range um, that could give us, raise some of the alarms about needing to look further and understand if we're actually undercounted or if there was something, um, you know, that shifted in our population that was real. So I have a, a kind of an add-on question that I want to just take moderator privilege to ask, which is, 
census data is so important, not only for all the reasons mentioned, but for business intelligence too, right? So all of our demographic data that we rely on are only as good as the, as the gold master, if you will, which is the decennial census. Are you seeing a fair amount of corporate interest and engagement on census yet? So I just had a, a meeting down at NBC Universal, and we started to talk about that. And Marcy Coppin of my team it heads up our sector research, and she's meeting. She's down in LA, so right now she's meeting with LA Chamber and a couple of other, you know, NFIB and other um, business associations to figure out how can we engage them. And um, Steve just asked a really good question. He's like, "What would make? What's the message to my, you know, corporate folks about why they need to be involved?" And and you. You captured it. It is the gold standard that they need to understand who their next customers are going to be, where they're going to put their next store. And if it's not right, or it's incomplete or inaccurate, then it'll affect their business plans. And I, just to add on, I know at the national level, um, national funders have been partnering with Ready, Ready Nation, who I think is trying to partner with different local chambers of commerce, having just kind of a toolkit for you know why is the census important to business? How can you engage? And I think that's also important because this should not be seen as a partisan issue, mm -hmm. right? Or even just a government or a philanthropy issue. Mm -hmm. It should be seen an issue for everyone, including, mm -hmm. including chambers of commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, saw a hand up there. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Joe Engel I'm from News and Review Publications. Perhaps you saw one of our publications uh, on the news last week. We achieved national notoriety or attention uh, by one of the um, outlets uh, for our publication that we did on Immigrant Know Your Rights. And I was actually, the, the question is about paid media, the R, RFP that's coming out. Um, when will that be? Because we'd like to try to help everyone get ahead of some of these myths. We actually have the capability and the um, experience uh, getting ahead of some of these types of myths and educating and doing outreach uh, and reaching some of those hard to reach communities with the publications that we've done in newsprint in different languages. So we'd like to really have the opportunity to apply for that. We're just curious. So the, curious. the RFP is out. It went out last Friday or the Friday before last. Oh, okay, it's already out. And there's a bidders conference this Friday that you should really come to uh, at our 400R, and it's at 1 o'clock, and Alana's here so she can answer questions. At that bidders conference, of course, we want news outlets, we want people who are potential subcontractors to come and meet all of those, because I think, you know, we always say, you know, the, the saying, it takes a village, you know, it takes all the villages, right, and all of the communities to make this happen. So we want to make sure everyone is coming together. So Friday, 1 o'clock. Hi, I'm Carolina Flores, and I'm the chair of LULAC here in Sacramento. And the concern that we have is the financial crisis. For instance, Sacramento City Unified, and recently they closed all of the preschool programs. Our concern is that the Latino families are leaving Sacramento in order to find, you know, appropriate childcare education for the kindergartners and the lower grades in order for them to survive. So are you taking this into your plan of how to be able to keep a hold of the people that are having, they're spreading out because of the crises of the school districts? I'm sure there's other school districts that are going through financial crises, but my concern is here in Sacramento. Are you preparing for that? So maybe one way to, if it's okay to uh, phrase that question, if there's population displacement, how do we make sure that we're capturing people with that kind of displacement? Where they are. So we're working with our local, you know, our local regions and our local counties as well, and whether they are migrating to other counties, they will be touched. We're also working with all our county offices of education. Um, we're primarily focusing on Title I and Title III uh, districts for Title I is school lunches, so low economic um, uh, standing, and then Title III is limited English proficiency, and so we're trying to invest those dollars uh, into both those schools as well as those counties who, many counties, they all serve uh, these underserved, hard to count populations. So regardless of where you're at, I know you're concerned with Sacramento, wherever they do migrate to, they, we want them counted and we'll work through that. And I think there's that saying, right, everyone should be counted once, only once and in one and place. In one place, correct. Right, so you don't want to double count people like college students, right? Yes. I mean, that's, it, 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 that was one of the maps when, when we had you come down. Mm -hmm. They talked about the, the, the places with the lowest response scores, right, from, from 2010 census, and it was in the census tract that contained the University of California Riverside, right? So, so, that is, um, so that's something in terms of counting people only once but there could be people that are left in the cracks in which you expect someone to be there 
and there's uncertainty about where they should be counted. Just a quick comment. I'm glad that you were prepared for that. I'm concerned about the ones that are going back to Mexico or leaving this state to go to Nevada where the resources and the taxes are cheaper. So it's not just that they're leaving this region, they're leaving this state. I think just to clarify, this is only a census conversation. I think that's a larger public policy kind of a question and what the implications are. But uh, it is only as of April 1st, 2020, 2020. right? Mm -hmm. um, so if there's any kind of population movement before or after, it's a snapshot in time and that's mandated by US law. Yes, the Constitution. Any other questions? Hi, so, so we have this like- Oh, could you say your name and your- Hi, my name's John Hanna. I work for Assembly Member Tom Daly, uh, cities of Santa Ana and Anaheim. And we have this map seeing where the hard, hard account communities are. I'm wondering with that data, are we gonna see any um, uh, targeted funding for specific strategies for census counting in these hard account communities? Well, I'll tell you, so you're within Orange County, right? Yes. So Orange County is actually a standalone region uh, for us, I think it's region nine. Uh, and so dollars have gone specifically both to uh, Orange County as well as the uh, administrative, and I think is it, I'm trying to remember who are in, is it Charitable Ventures Charitable of Orange Ventures. County? Okay, well, I can't remember all these. So they actually have dollars based upon the hardest to count communities. They also have overlays of what makes them hard to count, what languages they have to speak, um, so that they can best identify community-based groups in those neighborhoods to be able to do that outreach. So it's very specific, whether it's the clinica that they want to go and uh, fund because they have promotores there to reach out and educate the folks in Orange County and particularly in those hard to count areas. Um, I hate to say it, we're not reaching out to us easy to count. Like I don't expect to be seeing any ads or being reached out to. Uh, and probably all of you probably won't see them either because you're not necessarily hard to count. Uh, but yes, to your answer, if you want more information, we can connect you with our regional program manager that's working specifically with Orange County. Yeah, and Orange County Grant Makers is also, um, you know, trying to look to how to coordinate um, nonprofits in the region as well. Yeah, and I would say that's critical too because it's, while the funding has been helpful, it is by no means sufficient. I mean, we know that in the Inland Empire, but I'm sure it's true in all of these regions that we have to pick and choose the kind of census tracts where we're going to concentrate the door-to-door -door efforts and rely on media outreach, but hopefully philanthropy also and, and corporate money also scaling up so that it can meet that, uh, that gap. Um, because the state funding goes a long way, but it's not nearly enough uh, in terms of the outreach. That we need. My name is Rhonda Rios Kravitz, and I work with Sacramento Immigration Coalition, and particularly with detained populations. So immigrant populations that are in detention centers have extreme distrust. How are you creating the messaging to reach detained populations, not only adult, but those that are unaccompanied minors? So what I did hear from the US Census Bureau, and if you know as well, is that detained populations will be counted in the detention centers, uh, and then working with, I guess, for their families that are not detained, working with those community groups like your own in terms of those, the trust, uh, the issue to get them counted where they are. Well, that is uh, all the time that we have for today, but please, uh, please give a, a warm round of applause to our panelists here. I think I want to thank you, and I want to also thank the panelists for participating in the program today, Sarah um, and Melina and Didas. And uh, I think we all learned a lot, and I think that uh, we uh, have a lot of work to do. But I also found this conversation, which I compared to a year ago, when Didas and Sarah um, and Assemblymember Berman, Berman were on uh, our program together, I found this uh, to be actually very encouraging mm. in terms of the progress that's been made, the, uh, the smart people who are at work on this topic, and, um, and, and the plans that are ahead. Maria, thank you for, for leading us off today and for your work on the Citizens um, um, uh, Independent Redistricting Commission. And also uh, here today, Donna Lucas from our Board of Directors. Uh, this program, PPIC is very committed to doing work on the census. This program would not be possible without the support of our speaker series sponsors and 
all of the foundations that support our work on the 2020 census. So um, this is made possible through that. Thank you for, uh, for, for being part of this program. We will continue to be doing work on this, so stay tuned for PPIC's work on this topic, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.